en route to Lyon, November 12th. The cold grew more intense. Our hands and feet lost all feeling and our bodies became well nigh frozen. The icy wind penetrated our thick clothing and it was with the greatest difficulty that I could work the machine. Our breaths condensed on our faces and face masks and iced up our goggles and our helmets. Occasionally immense cloud barriers rose high above the lower cloud strata and there was no circumnavigating them. These barriers were invariably charged with snow and as I plunged the machine into them, the wings and fuselage were quickly armored with ice. Our airspeed indicator became choked and we ourselves were soon covered white by an accumulating layer of driving snow. Goggles were useless owing to the ice and we suffered much agony through being compelled to keep a lookout with unprotected eyes straining into the 90 miles an hour snow blast. In Pisa, November 15. On our arrival at the hangars, we found, to our dismay, that the aerodrome looked more like a lake than a landing ground. As we were taking off from Pisa, the plane tipped forward onto the nose skid. To overcome this difficulty, Sergeant Bennett applied the whole of his weight to the tailplane and once more opened the engines full out. Some of the Italian mechanics pulled forward on the wingtips and this time the machine started to move forward slowly. Suddenly I realized that Bennett was not on board, but as I got the machine moving at last, I was afraid to stop her again. I felt sure he would clamber on board somehow, as I had previously told him that as soon as the machine started to move, he would have to make a flying jump for it, or else take the next train to Rome. We gathered speed very rapidly, and after leaving the ground, I was delighted to see Sergeant Bennett on board when I looked around. Flying over Naples, November 16. The mighty Vesuvius was buried somewhere beneath the sea of clouds, so, reluctantly, I turned away and resumed our course to Taranto. Our course now lay due east across the Apennines. From some breaks in the cloud, the sun beamed down on the veils of great loveliness. Numerous small waterfalls dashed the mountainsides and streams like silken threads rippled away through the valleys. The lower steps of the mountains were terraced and wherever homesteads nestled, surrounded by cultivation. Sometimes we would be only a few hundred feet above the ground when crossing the crest of a ridge. Then we would burst out over the valley several thousand feet deep. Approaching Cairo, November 18. Our first glimpse of Africa was of a barren, desert coastline, but it was a welcome sight nonetheless. On reaching Solom, we turned and flew along the coast as far as Mersa Matru. The land below was flat and uninteresting desert, with nothing to relieve the monotony. Without landing at Mersa Matru, we headed direct for Cairo. Across the gravy brown sea of sand, passing over Vadi Natrum, which is merely a cluster of straggling palms beside a salt pan. We were not sorry to descry those landmarks of the ages, the pyramids, and soon we could pick out the minarets and mosques of the Egyptian capital itself. Now we were winging our way over Old Father Nile and across landmarks that were as familiar to me as the Heliopolis aerodrome itself, to which destination I was guiding the Vimy. Once we landed, I felt extremely happy. We had come through Suda Bay, a distance of 650 miles in a non-stop flight of seven and a half hours, thus completing the first and worst of the four stages into which I had divided the whole journey.
Ramadi, November 20. The sun was sinking in the west, and as we flew over Ramadi, it dipped below the horizon. I decided that there would not be time to do the 40 miles to Baghdad before dark. We selected a suitable landing ground among some old trenches close to a cavalry camp and landed. We were delighted to learn that there was a small supply of aviation petrol here and we obtained sufficient to carry us through to Basra without having to land at Baghdad. An Indian guard was mounted over the machine and the Vimy was secured for the night. However, while eating dinner, the wind changed direction and was blowing hard on the tail of the machine. The Vimy was in imminent danger of being blown over and crashed. We turned out 50 men from the nearest camp. They hung on to the machine until we started up the engines and swung her around into the wind. It was a pitch dark night and the gale whirled the sand into blinding eddies, cutting our faces and eyes. Throughout the rest of the night, the guard hung onto the machine and all stood by. En route to Bandar Abbas, November 23. Some of the country presents a remarkable sight and it appears as if a mighty harrow had torn down the mountainsides into abysmal furrows. Fantastic shaped ridges and razorbacks rise precipitously from deep valleys of vegetation and desolate of life. The whole earth appeared as though some terrific convulsion had swept it and left in its wake the fantastic chaos of scarred mountains and gouged valleys. In Karachi, November 24, my brother and I generally filled the tanks while Bennett and Shires worked on the engines. It was not much fun, after piloting a machine for eight and a half hours in the air, to land with the knowledge that we have to lift on a ton of petrol, besides doing innumerable jobs before we could go off to rest. In addition, we had to run the gauntlet of functions and ceremonies, and it was difficult to make folk understand that work had to be done. We deeply appreciated everyone's generous kindness, but I fear on some occasions, people must have thought me very discourteous. Delhi, November 25. I circled above Delhi to allow the people to see our machine, which had established a record by arriving 13 days after leaving London. A distance of 5,790 miles. We climbed cramply out of the machine and were welcomed by General McEwen, the Royal Air Force Chief in India and many other old friends. I regretted that I was quite unable to reply to their kind expressions as I did not hear them. The roar of the exhausts for nine consecutive hours flying had affected my ears so that I was quite deaf. <laughs> Departing Calcutta, November 29. A large number of kit hawks were flying around, alarmed by the size and noise of this new great bird in their midst. There was a crash, as if a stone had hit the blade, and then a scatter of feathers. It was a breathless, not to say terrifying moment, for we fully expected to hear the crash of broken propeller blades. I have never known so tiny an object as a cigarette end thrown carelessly into a propeller to cause the whirling blades to fly to pieces. en route from Rangoon, December 1. The moment one plunges into heavy cloud, there is misty blankness. All objects are lost to view, and as time wears on, a helpless feeling grows upon one that all sense of direction is lost. At first, all went well, but while turning to check over an engine, I apparently, and unconsciously, with the natural movement of my body, pushed one foot. 
which was on the rudder bar forward. This turned the machine off its course, and when I next looked down at my compass, I was 10 degrees off course. I then kicked on the opposite rudder to bring the machine back, but found I had put on too much rudder. In my attempt to correct the course and bring the needle back to its correct reading, I glanced at the airspeed indicator and found it registering over 100 miles an hour, 25 miles above normal flying speed, and we were flying at an inclined angle of 45 degrees. I realized that the machine was slipping sideways and that if I did not get matters right, at once the machine would get out of control and go spinning down to earth. It is useless to describe how I acted. The pilot does things instinctively, and presently my instruments told me that we were once again on our course and on an even reel. All this took but a few seconds, but there were anxious moments, as a single mistake or the losing of one's head would have been fatal. This happened several times at the end of what seemed to be several hours. I glanced at my watch and found that we had only been in the clouds for 12 minutes. Singapore, December 6. Near Kuala Lumpur, we entered the tin mining country and observed many dredges in full operation. Lower still, we flew across the rubber plantations, cheered by the planters and waving back. Then, passing above Malacca, we reached Singapore in the afternoon, after one of the most interesting stages of the journey. I had been dreading the landing and takeoff at Singapore, as the improvised aerodrome, the race course, was altogether too small for our large machine. I glided the Vimy down at as low speed as possible, and just before we touched the ground, Bennett clambered out of the cockpit and slid along the top of the fuselage down to the tail plane. His weight dropped the tail down quickly, with the result that the machine pulled up in about 100 yards after touching the ground. In Surabaya, Indonesia. December 7 to 8. My brother and I had decided that it would be impossible to get the Vimy into the air in the usual way, so we consulted with our invaluable friend, and he agreed to collect bamboo matting from far and wide so that we might construct a matte paved roadway. I observed that this matting formed the principal covering of the native huts, and subsequently learned that entire villages in the immediate vicinity were stripped bare to provide us with the necessary materials. So just 24 hours after our arrival at Surabaya, we made a sensational takeoff with the mats flying in all directions. In Timor, the night before departing for Darwin, December 9. Tomorrow would be the great day whereupon reposed the destiny of our hopes, labours and ideals. If an aeroplane is forced to land in the sea, it usually floats for a time. Then the forward part sinks and only the tail remains above water. Remembering this, just before leaving Timor we tied a parcel of food, a bottle of water, the very pistol and some cartridges onto the tail so that we would have something to fall back on in case of emergency. Over Bathurst Island, December 10. An hour later, both of us saw ahead what appeared to be haze, but which we hoped was land, though neither dared express his hopes. Ten minutes later, hailing Bennett and Shires, we pointed joyfully to Bathurst Island Lighthouse. Landing in Darwin, December 10. We circled over Darwin and came low enough to observe the crowds in the landing place. We landed on Terra Australis on December 10th, 27 days, 20 hours after taking off from Hounslow. 
We had won the race against time and the £10,000 prize with just 52 hours to spare. It was, and will be perhaps, the supreme hour of our lives. Almost reverently, we looked over the Vimy, and unspoken admiration crept over us as we paid a silent tribute to those in far-off England for their sterling and honest craftsmanship. The successful issue of the venture, in a great degree, was due to them, and surely they merited and deserved a large proportion of the praise.